It's a pleasure to welcome back also Karen Strunk to the Fields Institute. Karen is one of the organizers of the whole semester long program and we dragged her back uh, one more time for the last <laughs> week of the program uh, to, to join our conference here. Uh, the, as you can see, the title of her talk is Realizing Quantum Flag Manifolds as Graph C Star Arteries. So thanks for the introduction and also uh, to the organizers for in inviting me back. Um, I'm always happy to come back to my hometown. So it's a long flight, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, so as my title suggests, I will be talking about uh, quantum flag manifolds and graph C star algebras. So I hope in the time of my talk to be able to explain what these two things are and how they are connected. And um, I hope to strike a balance between uh, explaining things to some of the people that may not be very familiar with either of these two objects and hopefully not dumbing it down too much for people. Um, so uh, let me first tell you what a graph C star algebra is. So we start with uh, a directed graph and this contains uh, two sets, E0 we think of as vertices, E1 we think of as edges and these two maps are in S uh, we think of as giving their edges direction. So these are the range and source maps. Um, and you should think of something like this. So if we have an edge, I should have labeled this E, sorry, um, then this is the source and this is the range. So the arrow points from the source, the range. And uh, just a little thing you should be aware of that in the literature, uh, particularly those researchers in uh, Australia and New Zealand, they tend to switch the range in the source. <laughs> I assume this is the Coriolis effect. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. And unfortunately, the uh, so I, I am using this convention, but the main book that you will find on graph C star algebras, which is great, actually does it the opposite way. So just uh, to be careful there. Okay, so we take ourselves a directed graph and we want to construct ourselves a C star algebra from this. So how do we do this? Well, this is gonna be the universal C star algebra generated by uh, projections for each vertex. And we want these to be pairwise orthogonal. And we also have a collection of partial isometries uh, indexed by the edge set. And these are supposed to satisfy uh, some relations that uh, we read off from the graph. So first of all, we want that SE star SF uh, to be zero whenever E is not equal to F in our edge set. Uh, if we take SE star SE, then we want it to be the projection uh, of the range of that edge. If we do things in the opposite way, SE, SE star, um, then we don't want it to be the projection of SE, but we want it to be a sub projection. And then whenever we have a vertex whose uh, uh, has at least one edge admitted, ab admitting and at most finitely many, then we take uh, the projection should be the sum of all those edges whose source are at uh, V, SE, SE star. Uh, so this only makes sense, of course, when uh, there's at least one edge and only finitely many. And uh, just in case uh, most people maybe have, well, caught the fact that a lot of, there are some redundancies in these. So you, you could make a smaller list, but it's sort of useful just to have some of the implications uh, on there as well, just to keep in mind how things are working. Okay, so why would we want to look at graphs, Easter algebras? Why would we want to take something like a quantum flag manifold, which I will explain what that is in a moment and try to find a graphs, Easter algebra model? Well. Graph C star algebras are very well understood. So simply by looking at the graph itself, we can tell a lot about the structure of the actual C star algebra. So for example, you can immediately tell if it's unital or not. It's unital if and only if there are finitely many vertices. Uh, one can read off its ideal structure. 
you can tell whether it's, for example, stably finite or infinite, and this might not mean a lot to the NCD crowd, but some of the C-star algebra people will know what this means. And you can even uh, calculate his K-theory, which is very nice, because anyone who has tried to calculate K-theory will know that it can sometimes be a bit of a pain. And uh, we also know that the ideal of a graph for C-star algebra is, again, a graph for C-star algebra, as is the quotient. So this is also very useful. Now, it turns out that simple graph C-star algebras are always either AF algebras, which is approximately finite, so inductive limit of finite dimensional C-star algebras, or they're purely infinite. Um, so in this case, uh, we know from the C-star algebra classification program exactly what these are. We can classify them by K-theory. This is due to uh, uh, George, and then also in the purely infinite case, Chris Phillips, who's yeah, right here in the front, as well as Eberhard Kirschberg. And so one can uh, hope to use the understanding of uh, the interplay between their primitive ideal space and K-theory to try to make some sort of classification for graph C star algebras outside the simple case. And not a lot is known for classification outside the simple case. Sorry. Bradley, too. Yeah, yeah. Bradley's name should for sure be up there. Oops. Ah, no, no. Help. Ah, okay. Uh, right. And so this actually is a remarkable result due to Eilers, Restorf, Ruiz, and Sorensen who managed to prove uh, a classification result for all unital graph C star algebras. So it doesn't matter how many ideals they have, this is, they can be far from simple, and they do have this nice classification result. And this invariant that they use is some sort of K-theoretic invariant. So it's basically K-theory, but then you have to take into account K-theory of ideals and how these things all link up. So in principle, it is computable. Uh, I personally wouldn't necessarily want to do it if you just gave me an arbitrary graph, but um, uh, this is, yeah, really, really quite remarkable, actually, um, and very useful for us in this talk. Okay, so what are some examples of graph C star algebras? Well, there are many C star algebras you've met before in your lifetime. Here is a very nice graph. It has one vertex, one edge, and it, of course, it's, this is just going to give you continuous functions on the circle. Uh, this is immediate if you look at the graph relations. You're going to get uh, this, the edge, uh, the partial isometry from here will actually be a unitary. You have, it's unital, blah, blah, blah. Everything's good. Now, if we take two edges and one vertex, we get the Kuhn's algebra O2. And similarly, if we take n many, we get the Kuhn's algebra On. Again, this is really easy to show. Um, and infinitely many, of course, we get O infinity. Um, here is the n by n matrices, another one that will come up over and over, I'm sure, in this conference. Uh, this is the Kepler's algebra. And there are um, also some more sort of uh, maybe intriguing examples. So, so what are these? They all look quite similar with various numbers of vertices. Uh, these are quantum odd dimensional spheres. Um, and of course, you can guess what uh, CQS9 will be, for example, and this, this works for all odd dimensional numbers. Um, we have, again, by Hong and Chemansky, quantum complex projective spaces. Again, um, this is for any, any uh, N here. Um, and then Sophie Emma Zegar showed that this guy is the quantum surplectic seven sphere. And okay, uh, you might notice this looks just like uh, one of these spheres, and indeed it does, but this was not a priori known. So here's another example of where graph C's or algebras can turn out to be very useful. Well, um, as it turns out, it doesn't depend on Q. So oh, this is, an, so this is, that's a very good point though. So here is another point. You see that the graph, you see this immediately. You, you saw this instantly. It doesn't depend on Q. Um, and again, this was known, I guess, in these cases, I believe, because um, of some results due to probably uh, Nestle Evan Tset. However, I think it's way easier to see here. I mean, you see it immediately. So, 
Other examples are quantum lens spaces, quantum weighted projective spaces, quantum teardrops, quantum pillows. Um, so you could write a whole like quantum romance novel, I think, uh, using graphs Easter algebras, which is really great. Um, okay, so uh, quantum space, this will probably be familiar to most of the people here, but there are some uh, non-NCG people in the crowd. And also I wanna pin down precisely what I mean in this talk by quantum space. And the idea is that you take uh, some sort of Q deformation of the algebras of functions and a class of classical space. So we have a classical space, which we can just describe with generators and relations, and we want to Q deform some of the commutation relations where Q is uh, in mean zero and one. So an example that I guarantee we will see over and over at this conference is the uh, non-commuter torus. So we all know the two torus, is generated by two commuting unitaries. Well, now we want to stick in a Q uh, here in the commutation relation. And this gives us the uh, non-commuter two torus. And similarly, one can do the non-commuter n torus. And you can immediately see that if Q is one, we just get back what we started with. Another really well-known uh, example is the non-commuter three sphere. So the non-commuter three sphere, Uh, well, here you probably could do it with uh, whatever you want, but uh, when I'm talking later, I'll just be restricting to between zero and one. Okay, so, so not at a root of unity. Sorry, repeat. Ah, uh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, sorry, you're right. I should have been, yeah, it should have been e to the two, yeah, sorry, you're right. Thank you, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry. That yeah, uh, this is a typo. Yeah, there should be an E to the two pi I Q. Uh yes. Yes, that is true. It's not a graph of Easter algebra, that is correct. Yes, there are obstructions there, so it cannot be. Um right, so here is hopefully the Q is uh honestly a Q here, <laughs> which yes, it should be. So uh, the non-commuter three sphere is generated by elements alpha gamma, uh, subject to the relations that we have a unitary matrix here. And it's not difficult to check that if Q is one, we're just gonna get the usual relations of the three sphere. So uh, again, this, is an, this will be an important example uh, for what comes later on. Okay, so uh, how do we find these quantum spaces in nature? Well, uh, for compact connected, simply connected Lie groups and their homogeneous spaces, for example, these odd dimensional quantum spheres or the quantum complex projective spaces that we just saw, um, one can do this in a very precise way uh, that allows one to keep much of the nicely theoretic structure suitably interpreted. So these are particularly nice examples to look at. You get a lot of tools from uni theory uh, that you might not if you just tried to throw in cues willy nilly. Um, so for example, some of the structure that's preserved, we take uh, an odd dimensional sphere, then this admits a circle action and we look at the fixed points and we get, uh, we get uh, non-commutative projective space exactly as one would uh, in the classical situation. Um, for n equals two, this is known as the Podlesch sphere, which is a Q deformation of the two sphere and is quite well studied. Um, and as you can see, I didn't use LaTeX for my slides, uh, but even if I did autocorrect with the Podlesch sphere is maddening. So, this is, this is what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what autocorrect wants you to work with. Okay, so uh, quantum projective spaces, 
these are examples of a larger class of quantum spaces called the quantum flag manifolds. So these are what we're interested in. In the classical setting, a flag manifold is a simply connected, compact, homogeneous Taylor manifold. And in particular, they arise as quotients of simply connected, compact, semi-simple Lie groups. And this audience will actually probably know what Taylor manifolds are. When I talk to the Cether algebra, they want to ask me what they are. And then I have to tell them that I'm actually contractually obliged by my co-authors to tell you this fact. And I don't know so much about it. OK. Other than they're the best manifolds you could ask for. Complex. Yes, they're complex manifolds, indeed. Um, so uh, Lie groups, uh, compact semi-simple Lie groups, simply connected compact semi-simple Lie group, three groups admit a particularly satisfying two deformation um, via their enveloping algebra of the associated complex semi-simple Lie algebra. So how does one do this? Take your complex semi-simple Lie algebra G and its enveloping algebra UG, one can Q to form this in, in the same sort of sense I was talking about earlier. Um, and this Q deformation, you can do it in such a way that one retains the Hopf star algebra structure and one has the same representation theory as U of G. So how does one do this? Um, take a Lie algebra of rank R, then UQG is generated by elements EI, FI, and KI from, uh, oh, this, this I should be J, uh, sorry about that. So either that J should be an I or so I should be a J or more likely something got cut off slightly. Um, subject to these relations here. Uh, and okay, I don't necessarily expect you to take these in if these are the first time you've ever seen this, but if you're familiar with quantum, uh, sorry, enveloping algebras, then you can see that these look very familiar. Um, uh, basically uh, it's the K sort of uh, that, is kind of messing things up in a sense. So this is sort of the thing that we're using to cuneiform. We don't have this maximal torus type thing anymore. Uh, we have these k's instead. And then something called the quantum ser relations, uh, which I don't want to write down for you. Aha, uh -huh. this is a Cartan matrix. So uh, yeah, one does have to make a cho choice of Cartan matrix. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, well, okay, I am, why am I writing QI? Uh, the Q, the I will be sort of, yeah, important later because we want to keep track of uh, where we're going to put in uh, SECs, basically, quantum SECs. But okay, yes, no, it should really be the same Q, I guess. Okay, um, right, wrong way. So here is the hop. Algebra structure. Um, again, I don't expect you necessarily to take all this in. Um, and one can also endow this with a star algebra structure. And then we think of this as the compact real form um, given by setting the adjoints uh, as such. So if, uh, C is a Lie algebra of rank R, then these relations, which I just showed you, they can actually all essentially be read off uh, the corresponding Dinkin diagram. So uh, that makes things a little easier. Here are the Dinkin diagrams for complex semi-simple Lie algebras. And all these ugly relations I showed you here are somehow encoded in, in these guys. Uh, I knew you were gonna ask me this question. <laughs> um, and Coxeter is a fellow Canadian, so we would like to be able to say these are Coxeter diagrams. However, uh, there is a difference. Uh, Coxeter diagrams don't have directed edges. I think that's the difference, maybe. There, there, there is. I looked this up uh, before a different talk where I was talking about this, and then you maybe didn't ask me, and I was very disappointed. And now I can't remember. So, <laughs> totally unprepared. Coxeter Dinkin, we can go with Coxeter Dinkin. Uh, right. So we lose the alliteration, but we get a Canadian in there. That's nice. Uh, anywho, um, 
So dual to this quantum enveloping algebra is the quantum coordinate algebra. And again, this is how it works in the classical case, uh, which will denote this by curly O Q G. And this is a hot star algebra, which will always admit a C star completion, uh, which we call C Q G. Uh, and when Q is equal to one, then what do we get? We're just gonna get continuous functions on G. For G, the simply connected compact semi-simple Lie group that we associate with the Lie algebra G. So we think of these as, we think of this G as being somehow this Q deformation of, 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 of G, even though there isn't really an underlying G in the space. Now, um, OQ of G is a hot star algebra, CQ of G is not, because not all of the maps will extend. However, we do get a coproduct, and this uh, will give us a quantum group in the sense of Voronovich. So if you're familiar with those, uh, this spits out many, many examples of quantum groups, compact quantum groups. So a very important example is for G is SL2. Uh, so the Dinkin diagram is just a single node, doesn't matter which of the series you take, it's just a single node in any of them. And so our enveloping algebra is just generated by E, F, and K, quantum enveloping algebra. And our dual is gonna be generated by two elements alpha gamma, subject to the relation that this matrix here is unitary. And uh, a cunning eye will spot that we saw this already. Um, just as in the classical picture, we get that OQ SU2 is just OQ S3. And so also at the quantum group level, we get this uh, isomorphism. So how does one construct a quantum flag manifold? So we take a Dinkin diagram and choose a subset of nodes S. And then we define a subalgebra in the quantum envelopment algebra, uh, which will be generated by all of the KJs, but only the EJ, FJ, uh, when the Jth node is in this S. So we get, we're getting, again, we get uh, for the UQ of G, we're getting generators corresponding to each node. So we're gonna just keep the EJs when that node is in S. And uh, we can dualize this picture and this subalgebra now gives us a surjection of the OQG onto OQ, what I'll call big LS. And from this one constructs a right co-action, um, which I've given for you here. Uh, this delta here is the coproduct on OQG. Um, and uh, right, yes. So then our quantum flag manifold is just going to be this this uh, hop this sorry it's not going to be hop star algebra anymore but uh, star algebra that's given by the fixed points of this coaction. So this is entirely analogous to what one does in the classical setting. <laughs> And of course, this admits a C star completion. And we think of this as continuous functions on our quantum flag manifold GLS. When Q is one, we recover what we expect to recover, the continuous functions on the associated flag manifold uh, so one really considers this as a, as a very nice Q deformation. And since we've done this with all this, uh, uh, these nice Lie theoretic objects, uh, these are very nice things to study. One has a lot of tools one can use uh, to work with. So here is an example of uh, quantum projective space. So classically, uh, we can form uh, compact projective space is this quotient here. To form the quantum version, what we do is we look at the A and Dinkin diagram and we cross off the first or last node. It doesn't matter, this is uh, symmetric. And then S is gonna be our set of uncrossed nodes. 
And uh, one might ask if one can write down generators and relations for these things. So for example, I've, sh I've shown you that we know what they look like for the enveloping algebras. And in principle, this is possible. Um, but in practice, it's very difficult uh, and probably more trouble than it's worth. Uh, in particular, outside of the, say, CPN case, things get messy very quickly. So uh, these cues you're throwing in really do give you some kind of wild relations, which can be annoying to deal with. Uh, so in particular, we would like to not have to do that, which is one great reason to look for graph models. Okay, so the other nice thing about the Dinkin diagram is that you can read off the vial group of G. So how does one do that? You take a generator SI for each node I and the following relations. So every SI is idempotent. Uh, SI and SJ commute if there's no uh, nothing joining them in the Dinkin diagram. If it's connected by a single edge, uh, we have that SI SJ cubed is equal to one. If it's connected by two, then it's uh, SI SJ four is equal to one. And if it's connected by three, then uh, our exponent here is six. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about these Z-star algebras. Uh, one nice thing we can say about them is what uh, their representations look like, their star representations. So one can define a so-called elementary star representation in the following way. Uh, for each node I on your Dinkin diagram, we get a map from uh, UQSL2 into UQG by just deciding where to map the K, E, and F from UQSL2 into UQG. So we just map them to the I corresponding node. And this gives us a projective star homomorphism in the dual picture um, from which we can uh, define a star representation as follows. So uh, sigma I here is just our projective homomorphism and rho is an infinite dimensional uh, representation of CQSU2, which was originally written down by Voronovich. Um, it does what you see here. So it's some sort of uh, shift, weighted shift type thing uh, on one of the generators and just uh, multiplication by CZN on the other. So this, this gives us a representation of CQG. And we'll use this to construct the representations of our quantum flag manifold. So how do we do this? Well, we take the subgroup generated by those SI and WG such that the I uh, appears in our set of nodes. And we let WS be the set, well, uh, sorry, that's to say a set of coset represent representatives. Now, if we have some W and WS, then we can write it uh, in reduced form. And we take uh, this representation pi W to be the tensor product of all these elementary guys appearing in W. And of course, we have to precompose with uh, the correct power of the coproduct so that this makes sense. And uh, Dijkhausen and Stockman, following work of Zoebelman, uh, showed that this does not depend on the choice of reduced word. So as long as you're in reduced form, these will give you uh, at least unitarily equivalent uh, representations. And moreover, all the star representations of CQGLS are of this form. So this is a complete set. So it's, it's completely indexed by WGS. This means that our primitive ideal space is finite. And this allows us to appeal to results uh, in Euler's Euler's Thorsen, which tell us essentially that if you have a primitive ideal space, which is finite, and it looks like a 
graphs used to algebra and quacks like a graphs used to algebra than it is a graphs used to algebra. Um, which is very nice actually, because this is quite different from their other classification result where you have to know a priori that they're both graphs used to algebras. Here you don't have to know that. Um, so if you're in this special case where you have a finite primitive ideal space uh, and every sub quotient is either the compact operators or uh, the complex numbers, then there is an amplified graph such that A is star with multiplicity star of E. So let me say what these uh, things are here. Uh, AX is a simple sub quotient that we define as follows. I'm about to tell you. So for any open subset uh, U in term A, then we take A uh, U to be the intersection of all those uh, prime ideals uh, in trim A minus U. And for any pair of open sets whose uh, U, U minus V is X, then we set A of X to be this quotient. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. A graph is amplified if for every vertex, it's either uh, the source is uh, it's not it doesn't emit any edges or it emits infinitely many. So essentially, whenever there's an edge, there has to be infinitely many edges. So um, that's good. So if we can show that our our Seastar algebras uh, satisfy this, we already know that they have finite primitive spectrum. Then we know that they're isomorphic to some uh, graph Seastar algebra. Okay, but how do we know what graph? Um, and then uh, the Sword, uh, Sorensen, Eilers, and Ruiz actually give us a little bit more. We just need to compare their so-called tempered primitive ideal spaces to know that we have the right graph. Um, okay, um, what is this tempered ideal space? Well, actually, um, in our case, it won't matter. So just think of it as the primitive ideal space. Uh, so this is just supposed to be a homeomorphism. Um, and in our in our case, uh, that's all the information we really need. Okay, so what is a X for our uh, quantum flag manifold? Uh, okay, we know that uh, they're indexed by this W upper S, so these uh, coset representatives. I'm going to denote uh, a word in uh, the while group, the length as L W. And we're going to put a little order on these guys by saying that if V is in W and there is some U in W whose length is greater than or equal to one, uh, such that UW or WU is in reduced form, so there's no cancellation, then we'll say that W is less than V. So take our quantum flag manifold corresponding to the subset S of the relevant sigma diagram. And we take M to be the length of the longest element. So there's going to be a unique longest element in WS. And uh, whenever we have W in WS with length less than M, then we can put uh, UW to be all those pi V. So these are the associated representations uh, with V greater than W. And uh, VW will be uh, all those representations with V less than W. These are open uh, subsets of trim Q cube GLS. And pi, the singleton pi W will be, uh, sorry, there, I'm missing a W. This will be UW minus VW. So we get this sub quotient and one can calculate with not too much difficulty that this will be uh, <clears throat> the compact operators. So it follows that uh, indeed we know we have an amplified graph C star algebra. We just need to now find the right graphs. Okay, so <clears throat> how do we do that? Well, for that, we need to uh, say a little bit more about graph C star algebras and their structure. In particular, um, we need to know what, how do we find the primitive ideals in a graph? Okay, so 
this uh, figuring out what the ideals in a Grafsky's algebra, this is due to, I guess, uh, Bates, Shemansky, and Pask, I think, and then the primitive uh, spectrum due to uh, Hong and Shemansky, I believe, uh, which is a really, really nice result. So take a directive graph, and we'll write that V uh, is greater than W if we can find a path in the graph from V to W. So here, for example, uh, V is uh, greater than W, but not greater than Z, because we can get from V to W, but we can't get to Z. And then we say that a set of vertices is hereditary if whenever we have a vertex in H and some other vertex and a path from V to W, then we must have W in H as well. And we say that the set is saturated if whenever we have a regular vertex and the uh, range of, the, uh, of any vertex starting at V is in S, then we have to have V in S. So regular here just means that it's neither an infinite emitter nor a sink. Um, a graph satisfies condition K if whenever we have a vertex, one of the following is satisfied. If the source of an edge is V, then there is no loop mu. So a loop uh, is just some path that begins and returns at the same vertex uh, with that edge uh, in the path. And there are no two loops, mu1, mu2, both starting at, at, at V. Uh, no, sorry. If there are two loops, then neither is, uh, there, there are exactly two. So, and one is not the subpath of the other. So there's either no loops or at most two, basically. Uh, now our graphs for the quantum flag manifolds will never have loops. So in particular, condition K will always be satisfied, which means that uh, we can figure out what its ideals are very nicely. The last piece of information we need is this idea of breaking vertices. Uh, so if we have ah, that S should be an H, sorry about that. So given a subset H, which is hereditary and saturated, then the breaking vertices of H uh, is the set of vertices um, that either are infinite emitters or uh, the uh, edges that intersect those incoming guys minus H have to be uh, either empty or infinite. Right, so I guess this is what I just said. Again, this S, I guess, should be an H. Breaking vertices consists of infinite emitters with at least one at most finitely many paths leaving H. Now, um, one has to initially worry because our quantum flag manifolds, I, if you believe me, are gonna be amplified graphs, so they're indeed gonna have infinite emitters. Uh, but fortunately, uh, in, in our case, uh, for any hereditary saturated subset, this is actually gonna be empty. Um, so uh, our ideals will be, again, much easier to figure out. Okay, so we define a bunch of projections using our hereditary subset and a subset of the breaking vertices. And we can construct an ideal from this, these two H and B. This could be the ideal generated by these vertices, uh, sorry, these projections. And it turns out that if a graph satisfies condition K, then this is, this is all of the ideals. And so again, in our case, we can ignore the B and essentially they're just gonna be, we can identify all the ideals by the hereditary and saturated subsets. Uh, right, so this is what I just said. Um, if I is an ideal, then we can identify H and B uh, in this manner. Uh, but we're actually interested in primitive ideals, so we need the notion of a maximal tail. A uh, subset is a maximal tail if it satisfies the following three conditions. Um, so in a sense, it's sort of the opposite of being hereditary. Uh, if we have a regular vertex in M, then there exists an edge E uh, such that its source is V and its range is in M. And for any two vertices in M, there is some Y uh, that is uh, one can connect both V and W to. So this picks out the primitive ideals. If we have a hereditary saturated subset and V in 
uh, or breaking vertices, then this ideal JH singleton V will be primitive if and only if V0 minus H is a maximal tail. Okay, so what are our graphs? We take our elements WS and these are gonna give us the vertices. And we're going to put an infinitely many arrows from the vertex corresponding to V in WS the vertex corresponding to W in WS precisely when um, W is SIV or VSI or some generator SI. So the length is just uh, plus one. So for example, here is a GPN, quantum GPN. We cross the first node, our S is again the nodes that are not crossed. So one can calculate. Uh, WS, that's gonna be generated or consisted of exactly these guys. These are already in reduced form. Uh, so what does our graph look like? I guess I should have, uh, I didn't specifically say that, but we need uh, W and V here to be in, in reduced form. Maybe that was clear, but uh, that's important. Um, right, so what does the graph look like? Well, here's what it looks like. So it, it's clear that uh, S1 is a subword of S2, S1 is a subword of S3, S2, S1, blah, blah, blah. And this is, gives us an isomorphic graph C square algebra to what uh, Hong and Chemansky had. So in their case, they had extra edges uh, just joining everything, but those are superfluous. So they actually give us the same graph C square algebra, which was pointed out to me by Soren Eilers. So our, we can write them down a bit in a more simple form. A uh, second example is the full quantum flag manifold of SU3. In this case, we're gonna cross all the nodes and uh, WS is just gonna be S3. Uh, so this gives us the following diagram. Uh, so again, all these double edges are infinitely many. Turns out I didn't have time to draw all, all of the edges, so. I had to just do it like this, you know, time is money. Okay, so what are the consequences? Uh, as, as George pointed out, immediately we see that this does not depend on Q if Q is not equal to one. One might ask if it depends on if F2 equal to zero is included and my guess would be probably yes, in most cases it should be still isomorphic. That's some work in progress. Um, and we find some interesting isomorphisms that we didn't necessarily uh, already know. So for example, for any fixed N, uh, we can label nodes of Bn and Cn, uh, left to right is one to N. And if we just take the same, if we cross the same corresponding nodes uh, for our set S, then uh, we can look at the quantum flag manifolds that are associated with this. And we get that the C star algebras would be the same because we just see that the vial groups are the same. Uh, so we write down our, our graphs and they're, they're, they're identical. So we know that these are now, as C star algebras, identical. So this is not true at the level of the Hopf algebras, actually. So we see a lot of loss of information when we go to the C star algebras, unfortunately. But that's not so surprising. And as I mentioned, uh, we can calculate quotients of graph C star algebras quite nicely. Um, so uh, what I told you about how to find ideals, one can see that, for example, uh, V5 here, uh, is, that, is that what I'm about to do? I might do more than that. So if you take these three vertices here, this gives us our hereditary and saturated subset. So we can quotient out by the ideal that's generated by those vertices. And we get quantum CD2. And again, this is somehow what one would hope for uh, from what we know classically. And uh, one can do this again. So we take quantum CD2. We can identify B2. This is hereditary and saturated. So we can quotient out by that. Uh, and then we get the Pudlish, I mean the, uh, sorry, Podlish sphere. Um, and uh, yeah, all sorts of uh, neat little tricks you can play like this that again, it's just 
about playing with the graph. You, you don't need to even handle this Easter algorithms if you don't want to, which is very convenient because some of my collaborators on this project are a little C-star algebra adverse, um, coming from the more hop algebraic setting. All right, so just a few more words about some work in progress, and I'll probably finish a little bit early. Um, so we know by abstract method that uh, a quantum flag manifold is KK equivalent to its commutative counterpart. Uh, however, using this graph picture, uh, one can produce explicit KK equivalences. Uh, this was done by uh, Francesca Ricci and Sofiana Zegers for quantum projective space. And with Sophie and uh, Ray, we're trying to do this, uh, or we will produce these examples for uh, all of these flag manifolds. And another thing we'd like to do is, so uh, just a word about how our difference differs from Hong and Shemansky. So our, we've got this idea from Hong and Shemansky because they did this for quantum CPN. We had all these nice examples of quantum flag manifolds. We thought, let's just see what they did and generalize it, and voila, we've got a nice little paper there. Uh, so we looked at what they did, and what they did was they wrote down generators and relations for C quantum CPN, and they wrote down generators and relations on one side, and they kind of smashed them together. And so I tried to calculate the generators and relations for maybe the next easiest example, which would be uh, the quantum graph Mannion 4.2. And these are already kind of ugly. I, I was able to do it. But then to try to then put this together with the graph picture was proving very difficult. So our, uh, we get much more examples than they did. However, uh, we don't have an explicit isomorphism. Uh, we would like to find an explicit isomorphism now that we know one exists, because this will help us to determine uh, graphs for circle bundles over these uh, objects. So these are also nice quantum homogeneous spaces. They have C-star algebra completions. Um, and this would give us the analog of the odd dimensional spheres, uh, which they got as well. Uh, but for this, yeah, it seems like we will probably need to write down some explicit isomorphisms because there's no, once you have a circle bundle somehow in your primitive spectrum, you're gonna get a torus and this makes, uh, the class, there, there's no classification result saying that if it looks like a C graph C star algebra, it is a graph C star algebra, unfortunately. Um, so that's some more work in progress. Um, and we already know what, uh, what this should look like for, say, any of the graph Mannions. You just sort of should attach loops at all the uh, vertices and erase all, the, all but one edge. But as soon as there's more than one cross on your uh, Dinkin diagram, then there's more than one canonical, there isn't a canonical circle bundle, I guess. So it's not clear what the graph should necessarily be. Um, so that's a, that's a bit of a difficulty at the moment. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>